I have the pleasure to be visiting today with Lynx Guimong of Cell Cargo Inc., which is a company located in Costa Rica. Here they are building a ship called Seba. Seba is a it's intended to cross the ocean with cargo, but it's also intended for much more than that. We'll get further into Seba's mission in a moment, but first I want to introduce Lynx. Lynx is a unique person. Besides having crossed the Atlantic Ocean twice, which is pretty cool in and of itself, he's taken a lifetime of study and construction, art, design, carpentry, wood crafting, and he has brought it together into a mission that currently has about 20 builders on deck creating, co-creating this mission together. Uh, Lynx has been in Costa Rica since 2009. The cell cargo entity uh, was created in 2018, and they're about halfway through the build on this giant ship. If you're interested in seeing any video of what this might look like, we do have an episode on our YouTube channel that you can link to from the show notes. But for now, I'm going to introduce Link here, Links here and give him a chance to tell us a little bit about how he came upon this place and to embark on this amazing mission. So, Links, how'd you get here? Well, I, hey, Jason, I think that's kind of a long story. <laughs> Try summing it up, sticking to the point. I mean, uh, yeah, being in the sailing world now for, I, I'd say, close to 15 years now, um maybe more like 20 um and uh yeah life of traveling the world and working in different projects uh mostly related to construction and, and woodworking uh i guess i can say that uh um a building a wooden ship a wooden sailing ship in the, the tropics is something that we is an idea we've thrown around for yeah over a decade now with uh, my old shipmates and old shipbuilders i used to roll with back in the day um and then yeah just a few years ago we decided to pull the trigger on it and give it a try and uh you know what do you, how do you say jump off the deep end <laughs> and we did and uh, we're still here and still going strong and it's and if things keep going well well we're, we're going to keep doing them well right great so share with our audience a little bit now you you, know, you were in Costa Rica already, you were living in Monteverde, uh, you were doing some interesting things up there. I met you originally, you were looking for a biodynamic beekeeper to help uh, you with a project up there. How did you go from living up in the mountains to down here on the coast with this project? Were you intending to do a no-carbon eco-ship when you started all this? How did this unfold? Well, I mean, that's a pretty easy answer, I think. Uh, uh, when I was living as a woodcarver in Monteverde, um, lower temperature, cloud forest, very, very enriching environment to spend time in. Um, when we decided to pull the trigger on the project, uh, building the ship, we obviously had to move to the coast, right? You don't want to throw it down the, <laughs> the mountain. You want to be as, build your boat as close to the water as you can, right? seems practical for obvious reasons so yeah that's why we came to the coast then that's when we came to the coast we we had to search for the land we started from scratch and uh, built the business up from nothing and uh, uh started seeking investors all those things and then we then we did some some due diligence research and found this nice piece of land here which which uh, we rent um and basically had to put up a shipyard build up a it's kind of a campsite i was call it like it's, it's still it's still in a campsite mode because um, the object is to build the ship and put it in the water, right? So everything that needs for that to happen, uh, we do in a, a minimalistic a fashion, basically. And in a minimalistic fashion, you have one and a half hectares of land here, and yet you've got a work crew of 20 people, uh, builders, not to mention your admin and your cooks and so forth that are running all week long. How many of those people live on site? So living on site now, uh, we have, um, I'd say, less than half of the people who work uh, here with us on site uh, come from abroad. 
right? Which is basically essentially um, uh, naval carpenters, right? Shipbuilders, wooden shipbuilders, mainly from Europe, some from North America. Uh, we've had a, an, an odd African too come around. We have an Australian now working with us. Um, yeah, we have from pretty much all around the world where cultures build wooden ships. Uh, we import these people uh, to work on the project. Um, uh, essentially um, to bring their knowledge to the shipyard, uh, training the professional local carpenters we hire here. Uh, the reason being in Costa Rica, this type of work has never been done before. It's something new to this part of the world. Uh, they never built wooden ships here before of the size. So, so we import a lot of knowledge, you can say that. So the people who come from abroad, we give them room and board. Uh, some of them even make, end up making their own little house here, a little shack on site. Uh, there's no snow load to worry about. Uh, and it's warm and hot year round, so we don't even really need walls. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just screen for the mosquito is pretty much our biggest uh, a protection we need from the elements. So while definitely Building a ship, getting it in the water, having it be safe and sound and ready for an amazing uh, adventure is the goal. That's, the, like, that's what you're working toward. There, this is a homestead project. This is a project where you have, you've been building structures as you need them. You've got a base infrastructure to host some people. You guys have some organic gardening going on. You've been developing a fruit forest on a small piece of property. And it's, uh, it's actually pretty impressive. You told me that you're producing sometimes 20% of your food for your crew here off the land. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is only recently, like it's taken us a, you know, we've only started seriously investing in our, in our food, in our food production, basically since the pandemic started and, uh, the, and the nonprofit branch of our organization, uh, usually giving, uh, free courses to locals building wooden fishing boats, basically from our offcuts of the big ship. Um, yeah, since the pandemic, we can't give these educational courses anymore. So we've shifted our focus to the community gardening program and to, uh, our tree planting program, which is where we end up planting, uh, thousands of trees to not only replace the lumber that we use for our buildings and for our ship, ships, boats, um, but also to to regenerate forests, uh, mostly in agroforestry systems, depending on the plots of land and the farmers that we work with, right? So this is a big part of our nonprofit is, you know, it hits the social marks, it hits the ecological marks, and uh, we, we, we bring a lot of money into the country, actually, through donations for the nonprofit and through investments from the for-profit, which is the shipping, transport shipping company of the ship we're building. Uh, can you can you share with our listeners the name of your nonprofit for the tree planting? Yeah, so unofficially it's Astiro Verde, right? Uh, but the real name is As Asociación de las Tierra Saiba del Mar. Um, uh, some call it the Jungle Shipyard. Some call it the Green Shipyard. Some Astiro Verde essentially means Green Shipyard. Um, that's what we're known by locally. Great. And we'll uh, share some links for that, uh, any listeners that want to follow you there. Now, really, one of the well-crafted things you have here is this layering of associations because you're not just working with this local project. This is a prototype for something else that uh, you're working with teams to design some like zero emission vessels that are using electric ship propulsion aiming for clean ocean cargo and so in order to work with all of these different teams and different interests you've got a, a some layering of organizations that uh, you have established mm -hmm. can you give our listeners a little rundown of that yeah, so uh, basically what, what we've been trying to do is create a scalable model, right? So, we, so we, we're focusing always on a, on a full regenerative uh, a system, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are, um, I mentioned to you on our conversation earlier that uh, we are professional shipbuilders and we're professional sailors and that's kind of what we do. 
but now we're trying to do it in a fashion that is within a regenerative circular system, right? So, you know, making your own food, uh, building your own ships, growing your own shipyard, shipbuilding lumber, uh, planting trees, uh, training local people, uh, helping local farmers produce cargo to ship on the ship. Um, all these things fall under this regenerative system. So that's what led us to found the nonprofit organization as, a, as basically a platform for sustainable practices, right? So the, the educational programs and the, and, the, and, the, and the community gardening programs, these all fall under the nonprofit organization. Where the shipping company itself, which is Seba, uh, it's basically like a, a, a transport company, right? It's it's uh, the, that that is a for-profit company. Uh, mission is to prove the economical viability of an ecological endeavor, right? Um, with a lot of um, yeah ethics behind it, I could say. Um, we try and de delve as deep as we can. Uh, that's basically viable, but our end goal is to put this ship in the water. This is basically, uh, this ship is spearheading the entire organization because it's it's attracting a lot of international attention. And through that, we get a lot of support, whether it's through human resources or through funding, et cetera, right? And so you have, you have investors contribute, or well, you have investors in the ship and it's for-profit mission and you have the nonprofit for the ecological I guess balancing of the footprint or exceeding even you guys are planting far more trees than you're using mm -hmm. yeah and uh, as far as your um, internal structure here on more of the community standpoint with what you're doing with the the laborers and all of that where does that fall into the mix that's all under the shipyard business yeah basically um uh like the for-profit company uh, is building the ship and the for-profit company is employing uh, all the people who work on the ship right and we actually pay our carpenters a higher than average wage here and uh, and there's a share system too set up where where most of the long-term uh, employees also earn shares in the company right so then they, they, they it's 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 giving people an ownership of their own project and they're actually investing in their own future as well as earning a good salary that's something that's always interested me at my place we have uh, uh, at least one employee that's been with us for many many years all of our years really and he's uh, yeah, he's been a, a gem to our project, and we've always talked about, you know, offering him value of the project in whatever way that gets to be, although we've never really formalized it yet. So the concept is there. But can you describe a little bit more about the details of how that shareholding feeds out? Like, how long does somebody have to be in the program before they're considered for that? How are those shares earned and distributed? Yeah. Okay. Well, basically, I said we pay a, a fairly good, about average, above average salary, but that's for Costa Rica, uh -huh. right? Um, uh, the Europeans who come here, uh, in comparison, is pretty low to what they can earn in Europe, right? So this is a way of kind of balancing it out. Uh, they they get room and board um, as well. Uh, we feed everybody on site, uh, morning and noon. Um, and uh, the shares is kind of a way of like uh, 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 leveling out the balance a bit. You know, it gives you a bit more incentive uh, financially, right? When the ship is earning money, then it's the idea is that the workers who are who are just, I mean, essentially a carpenter or, or, or a shipyard worker is just earning a salary. It's a, it's a normal nine to five job in many senses, and. A lot of people in this construction industry never get to the point where they're going to become a business person and invest in the company and have money to play play around with, right? In the corporate world, these people are just paying their rent, buying the food for the family, and you know maybe they'll buy a car down the road, you know. And that's you know, so so it's also teaching people a bit about you know the business side of the project because all the employees uh, they all get the shareholder updates, the newsletters. Uh, they're treated like any other shareholders. We have over 140 shareholders in the company at the moment. 
and uh, so it's very widespread, right? It's it's a it's a it's kind of a hybrid business model. It's been called because it's not conventional in many ways. It's obviously a high risk investment, but uh, it's also uh, an environmental and and uh, and an ethical investment at the same time. And a lot of most of our investors are very um, how do you call it, e- ecologically oriented, right? In that sense, is there? A system for incentivizing longevity with the project or just all employees automatically get shareholding How exactly where does that line come in where someone is considered uh, for that program well I mean essentially it's a, a specialized labor like a specialized worker who is essentially indispensable to the project uh, because of their skill set uh, who stays more than three months. Okay. Right? So the first three months is like a, not really a trial, it's more a long-term trial, I guess you could say, but if after three months someone's sticking with the project, then they're investing more than than a, a long vacation, work, work away vacation, right? And uh-huh. So so it's the, also to also incentivize people to stay long longer term, right? right. And when I say people, I'm, I, right now we're talking about the foreign foreign workforce. Right, uh-huh. all the local workforce, everybody we've hired, and uh, not one person has quit. Uh-huh. Right, we have job applications, several per week, very easily. We're in one of the poorest parts of uh, Costa Rica here. Uh, it's called a marginal community. They call it. The government refers to it as. Um, so we're creating a lot of job opportunity here, and 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 uh, we I think we're getting a lot of good feedback, not only from the employees but from the community and the and the and the, and, and the rippling effects that we've had in this very small community that we live in. You've established this dream to create a for-profit and for-benefit business. You've created a non-profit organization so that you can receive donations to fund the establishment of your regenerative systems both here on the land as well as your outreach projects and education programs and all of this is really just the beginning to the greater mission which is to create this prototype for a zero emission vessel tell our listeners a little bit about these technologies that you intend to use in this ship as well and then also i'd like to get into this project you're doing with the hydrogen projection uh production mm-hmm. so let's start with saba how is saba a zero emission vehicle a vessel right. well it's basically um, a traditionally built three-masted a top sail schooner which is basically a big tall ship like some people would call it like the yeah, like a pirate ship. I don't like to use the word, <laughs> but it, but for the general public, you could call it something like that. Um, uh, the sailing sailing is the main propulsion. Ninety percent of the energy comes from the wind, pushes the sail ship like it's always like it's done for thousands of years. Except we're we are integrating this new technology with uh, a lithium ion ion battery source, um, variable pitch, high torque low speed uh, propeller shafts right which are specially designed to create about 300 kilowatts of uh, energy of, of torque right to uh, to propel the ship this this auxiliary uh, a propulsion system is mainly for moving the ship in and out of ports or in an emergency during a storm uh, a man overboard maneuvers um, when you really need you know, to get somewhere fast, well, then that's what the engines are for. Sometimes the wind's not always in your favor, right? Um, so this system we've been working on for a while. Um, we work with the Tecnológica, uh, Univer- Tecnológica de Costa Rica, a university, a university that, uh, that, that is also working with uh, Ad Astra Rocket Company, through which we got the contact through them. And uh, the Ad Astra Rocket Company is also working with the nonprofit now directly to um, for a, a viability study into um, hydrogen, a non, an, a, an, um, a land-based hydrogen a, a production facility to be able to make green hydrogen uh, out of water, basically, um, f- to use in ships like Saba, right? So, so, so hydrogen is becoming a new thing in the maritime industry. 
Uh, the International Maritime Organization is pushing now to lower carbon emissions in this sector, which is something that uh, we're trying to do, actually. Um, yeah, so working with Ad Astra, they, they, they have all the technology to make this happen. They've been in the business for over 10 years now. Uh, they do intercity buses in San Jose and the campus, uh, uh, the university campus I was just talking about, all their buses run on hydrogen. It's been very successful. Um, we've done also a economical viability study comparing conventional diesel uh, a propulsion with the electric uh, propulsion and now also with uh, versus the hydrogen propulsion. Uh, SAVE is being already designed for electrical uh, which could potentially have a hydrogen tank add-on system to create another source of power when needed. Although we're getting kind of redundant now in their power sources, you know, like you, mm -hmm. you, it's, it's always good to have an, a backup power source and auxiliary drive, but to have two, it's starting to become a lot. However, uh, given the given the, the popularity of the project, the high profile international um, yeah profile of the project is attracting a lot of attention. So we get to showcase all these new technologies actually, right, by putting the ship to work. So it's it's uh, it's kind of a a, a niche uh, kind of a niche, I guess you can call it, in the shipping industry. We don't try and compete uh, directly with. Uh, the biggest container ships in the world. These biggest container ships in the world can carry, I think, something like up to 50,000 containers at one time, whereas Seba will be able to carry the equivalent of nine container loads, right? So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, a grandma at the farmer's market selling her cookies uh, versus the Nabisco Cracker Company, you know, like it's it's not really comparable, but it is, right? But it is. So so we also strive to bring a lot of attention to the impacts of cheap shipping, right? Like I told you, I told you earlier, <laughs> Europeans do not need to eat pineapples every week, right? Um, cheap shipping allows people to consume cheap goods that come from all over the world 90% of everything we consume is shipped overseas the global industry relies completely on global shipping yet there are no incentives uh, for shipping companies to use cleaner energies there's no financial incentive uh, just, I mean it's just the way things are set up right I don't I'm not, I'm not an, an economist so I'm not gonna say things I don't, I'm not sure of but I know that uh, uh, it's it's severely lagging behind right so they're coming out with electric cars even cars powered by hydrogen now and people are all into you know there's the sustainable building movement there's the permaculture movement but you don't no, no, nobody really sees what goes on at the, at the high on the high seas right in the oceans and that's like a whole world that's that we don't really see right we don't we're not aware of it a lot of people are just not aware of it so we also strive to promote ethical and responsible consumerism is one of our biggest end goals of this game, right? All right, start with the, the core or the source of the problem. And while overconsumption and in less than conscious consumerism is uh, you know, a problem that really plagues uh, our planet, and uh, that's a whole other topic. That's the big topic, I guess, of, of why all these projects are worth getting their stories out. Um, this particular issue that you're passionate about is something, uh, I think a lot, I, I learned something new. You know, you, you talk about, you've got, you've got an electric propul you know, electric system to supplement your wind sail and that's great and i imagine the batteries get charged while the wind is blowing the boat and the propellers spin and charge the battery yeah so sounds great uh it's a i'm sure it's a much higher cost engine so there's this increased cost and you're like okay well you're only using 10 percent of your you know motion is being run by fuel so it's like okay well neat but then really looking at the gravity of what you're replacing is not just you're not just replacing refined fuels like my electric car does 
tell the listeners a little bit about what you know about how standard shipping is gone and what kind of fuel they're using. Yeah, so basically these cargo ships run essentially on, uh, it's called it's called bunker fuel. Uh, what people don't know, bunker fuel to be uh, a byproduct from the petrol industry, right? So the biggest shipping companies in the world, they own their own oil platforms, their own uh, shipyards, their own, yeah, they, they it's, the, the list goes on. They, they own their own steel plants. Um, not to mention the whole ship breaking aspect. If you want to del- delve into something environmental, uh, it's kind of a side note is the, is the ship breaking, which is a whole different, I can talk about that in a bit. Coming back to the bunker fuel, um, these ships, uh, they burn hundreds of tons of bunker fuel in per day, right? That's how much of this fuel it's basically the lowest grade uh a petrol byproduct that exists uh it at room temperature it's solid you can walk on it they need backup engines just to be able to generate enough heat to be able to liquefy this bunker fuel to be able to burn it and these engines that are gigantic right they they can move those fifty thousand containers uh at uh, 20 nautical miles an hour right over the ocean so think about the energy that that takes right that's a lot of fuel right yeah. so if sh- if shipping was a country uh, it would be the ninth biggest polluter of the world right after you know uh yeah germany united states and uh, i don't know the other okay <laughs> so it's significant seven, right? so yeah it's a it's a it's a big polluter and it's something that uh uh like i said it's it's not in the big corporations interests financially to lower their emissions they have no incentives um it's not something it's they're actually uh creating a, a a way of of burning their waste right and making money from their waste which is the bunker fuel right so if so if we're not going to use the bunker fuel on these giant ships what are we going to do with it right they can make asphalt with it as well but you can only lay down so much asphalt right Yeah, that sounds like a problem worth remedying. Yeah. So besides the electric system, I want to touch back on this hydrogen production. This is something that it's an idea that you are working with a team of scientists to develop that could work on a ship like SABA, but it's a technology that is also applicable to any energy production. Yeah. And even to help run a place like this. Mm-hmm. How practical do you think is? You guys are using a lot of power tools, maybe some uh, petro-fueled um, machines, chainsaws, things like that. Is it really practical that you could produce your own hydrogen gas right here on the farm to create enough energy to run all these machines? Oh, I mean, it would definitely definitely be in our best interest uh, to be off the grid, uh, self-sufficient energy-wise. That'd be amazing. Uh, however, this is a new technology and it's very costly. Okay. Right? It's very costly, so the initial investment is huge. You know, again, not very economically viable when you compare it to just buying a big diesel generator mm-hmm. and burning diesel or just buying your your electricity off, off the grid, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think you might know this already, but 99% of Costa Rica's electricity is generated through hydropower, renewable resources. So, so in in a sense, we already are using clean energy when we use our electric tools here. Um, but again, it's more about a question of just showcasing now that these things can exist, right? And we could run our whole shipyard off hydrogen if we had the if we had the funding for it. Uh, the nonprofit infrastructure. The nonprofit association's infrastructure is set up with this, and we, with our association with the Ad Astra Rocket Company, they have the technology to do it. Uh, their mission is to start promoting hydrogen in a big way, a scalable way, as a new clean source of energy. And uh, we're hearing now this year, I heard several projects that are taking place. Uh, uh, there are European cities now that by 2030 want to be all hydrogen. Um, big, big. Big uh, plans are happening in uh, the first world countries to actually shift towards hydrogen. They're even putting airplanes. They had the first airplane fly now with with powered on hydrogen. Uh, the, I think uh, is it 
Mazda, I think. Uh, anyway, one uh, car company has released a hydrogen-powered car. I forget what it's called. Um, there is ships use liquid nitrogen gas, um, which is another quote-unquote clean energy, except it's fracked, right? Okay. So there's green hydrogen and there's not green hydrogen, right? There's two types. And uh, green hydrogen takes takes actually quite a bit of electricity to be able to produce, right? So you actually end up using 40% of the energy you produce to make more energy, right? Um, I'm just starting to learn about it. Uh, so I won't get into too many technical details, but we have uh, an in-house engineer who's who's been working on this with us. He did his thesis on us actually, from the from the Tech University, and he got a hundred hundred percent. By the way, we're very proud of him. And we already knew we were we already knew that we were going to hire him before he was finished his studies. So he works with us now full time. He's actually playing a, a pivotal role in this whole hydrogen study part, actually. No, it sounds like you have a team of highly valuable people on your crew. Yeah, uh, all through the, the ranks. So here, besides building the boat and creating these prototypes for efficient energy and growing your gardens and feeding your people and taking care of them, the culture here feels really, really harmonic. Like the, everyone really seems like they're enjoying each other's company and... Uh, you're definitely getting some stuff done your outreach continues in the way of courses obviously you have boat building courses that you've provided here but you're also providing blacksmithing courses which i think is super cool uh the trees for seas nonprofit that's planting all these trees which uh I, i'm I'll be talking to you more about Sharing Insights has some tree planting ambitions mm -hmm. on the yeah. horizon here. Um, but you also have further ambitions to continue developing your base camp here with other permaculture and biodynamic innovations. Go ahead and describe to us a little bit what you have on the horizon as far as uh, waste and water recycling for your crew. Yeah, so I mean, on site we currently have uh, 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 an aquatic plant gray water filtration system that we send all our gray water through, and, it, and the, actually the roots from the plants uh, purify the water in a way that I mean, it's not it's not a drinkable water, but it's drinkable for the rest of our plants, basically the gardens which we use. However, we would really like to uh, invest in a big biodigester, which would be more efficient, uh, capturing the methane gases. Um, yeah, that's pretty much would be the, the, one of the biggest things we have like a whole new, I, I'm, it's, yeah, it's, it's more than a bathroom. It's going to be an aquatic center, okay. <laughs> right? Where you can collect the, 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 the water from the showers, even collect rainwater, uh, use that to flush toilets, to put into bio, to put into the biodigester and, and so on and so forth. Uh, also with our composting toilets, which has been working pretty well for us. Um, yeah, water is the main thing. We even have plans to make small uh, salt water solar distilleries so we can eventually just make our own fresh water. Um, it would be nice at a small scale, of course. Uh, on board the ship, we can showcase as well these little technologies. Um, it depends too lot on the regulations and there's a lot of, uh, uh, I call it, um, unknown factors that we still have to get through and it's these are all just fun ideas at the moment but if you keep talking about it then some sooner or later sometimes they happen right that's exactly how they happen yeah uh tell me a little bit more about how you're advocating for responsible consumerism yeah i mean like i said uh uh people who live abroad don't need to consume products uh, it's basically essentially a luxury products, right? So of course now we're in the habit of we, we go to the supermarket, we we know what we like. Uh, we don't really question where the products come from. And I'm just talking for about food now, for example. But it goes from cars to your cell phone to your computer to to the blinds you bought to that lampshade over your table. You know, like it's 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 nice. I pick it out. I buy it. You know, I don't think about who made it, where. 
what type of conditions it was made in, where the materials came from. I just basically buy the product, you know? Like I used to just buy sardines. I used to eat a lot of sardines from the supermarket several years ago, right? And I would just take the sardines that were on special. They all look the same, all the name brands, they all look the same. And uh, then I started reading uh, behind the little tiny fine print at the bottom of the sardine can. And, you know, I live in Costa Rica and here we fish a lot of sardines. It's a local product. Um, but this, but the competition, it, the same type of can, it's very similar. It's the same product essentially, except it comes from Thailand or it comes from maybe Cambodia, right? And it's cheaper than the Costa Rican sardines, you know, and it's the same for rice, you know. Uh, a Costa Rica produces their own rice. They used to produce all their own rice. Now I think I think only 20% or something is produced here, you know. And in the supermarket, I have to look at all the bags of rice to find one bag of rice that comes from Costa Rica. And I now buy that Costa, that, that, that rice. Uh, I don't buy the rice from United States because it's imported. Why would I buy, why would I give, give you know... It's one of those easy You're things. You're funding the burn of this bunker fuel it, exactly. every time. Exactly. Yeah. Transportation is Directly. so is so cheap. I can buy cheaper rice from the United States than I can buy locally produced Costa Rican rice, which is very delicious, and it's a staple food market of this country. And um, and people are, are buying imported rice now, and they don't even know it because it's this tiny little, tiny little print, and sometimes it's not even written. Sometimes you can't find out where this product is from because it's not even... so. A responsible consumer is going to look into this, right? A responsible consumer, it doesn't matter what type of... Both rices taste essentially the same. Both sardines taste essentially the same, except one comes from the other side of the world and one comes from the local fishermen, right? So if the consumer is ethically responsible and aware, you have to start by raising the awareness first, you know, and then put that responsibility on the consumer to actually investigate or the supermarket owner to put a big sign where the products are from, like they do in Sweden. All the, the supermarkets in Sweden, anybody who's bought food in Sweden, you can see that all the vegetables have nice big signs of the country of origin. It's very well well done, you know? So you have the apples from Chile and you have the apples from Sweden. I'll buy the Swedish apple. You mm -hmm. know, I might prefer the Chilean apple, but hey, I, I'll, try, I'll when in Rome, I'll do like the Romans, right? Or I'll, when in Sweden, I'll eat the Swedish apples. You know, that's kind of kind of my angle now you know that's where i'm at these days it's my personal ethical consumerism <laughs> right no it's it's a it's a really a vital thing for people to be thinking about uh whether it's buying their food their clothes their tools buying locally is really uh, a huge huge impact on our global climate situation mm -hmm. for sure before we go, tell our listeners a little bit about where they can learn about you, the this project, your nonprofits. Where can uh, where can people find out how to follow you and contribute even? Well, uh, there's there are the web pages. I guess you're gonna put it on on the. I have some notes down yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, on the notes there, uh, sellcargo.org and astieroverde.org is the nonprofit site. Uh, through there, you can find all the links. Uh, we're also uh, very active on social media. So we have Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we have a really nice YouTube channel. We have in-house filmmakers doing a really great job, and it's it's a lot of fun if you want to if you like those type of things. You can see see about the life here and how we're building a ship. I can attest. I saw some of those videos before coming over, and I got very excited. Yeah, yeah nice. very well done. Thank you. Before we go, Lynx, do you have any last words of advice for listeners that either have land that they're currently developing, they want to get some land, they want to do a project, they want to really make their dream come true, they've got a, an ecologically beneficial or socially beneficial idea, they want to make it happen, and they might only halfway know where to start. Like Any, any advice to really help people get their their feet on the ground with their project yeah sure i mean i mean listen you got to use your talents we, 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 i find as humans we have the re responsibility to use our talents in the best way that our heart tells us right so listening to to deep down what's what's your real dream if that's your dream you got to go for it you got to try you just got to at least try and then if you fail you fail but at least you tried don't want to spend your life 
not trying to live your dreams, right? And to do what you know you're meant to do, right? And just go for it. And if, if you have faith in that, then you're not going to fail, you know? Then you, there, there's no failing. Even if you don't succeed, you're not going to fail, you know? If you're at least following your heart, you're following your path. That's what I'd say. Um, another thing that you seem to have done in very well here is build a team of qualified people working in harmony together. Is there any secret sauce to calling that together? Well, I don't know. I mean, you don't want to make someone feel like they're just a cog in a wheel, right? So we really try and give ownership to the people uh, for their projects. So we give a lot of leeway. Uh, we usually start by asking a new member of the team, what do they want to do here? Like, like uh, forget about what I have lined up for you. You're here, obviously, because you want to be involved. But how do you see yourself being involved in our project, right? And then from there, we compare of what we need them to do and see if we find that happy balance point. Uh, I always tell everybody, too, there's two main criterias that need to be filled to work here is you have to be healthy and you have to be happy. So if you're not both of those things, we need to take a step back, take a look at what's not, why you're either not happy or not healthy, and, and, and to be able to move forward again, right? And then fix the problem. If there's a problem, work it out. Some people just aren't made for shipbuilding, even though they might think they are, but at least they tried, you know? Mm. But those people, they, they usually end up on, on, the, on the coffee farm, picking coffee beans, which is perfectly all right, you know? And there's, there's, that's, that's just, you know, people on their path <laughs> through life, <laughs> right? Great advice. Thanks so much, Lynx, for having us over, taking the time to do this interview. And of course, for anyone listening, definitely check out the YouTube video on Sharing Insights channel to see some of the, see the ship, see some of the cool tools that you guys have invented to make life easier here, as well as some of your uh, organic food production. And definitely check out the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll have a link in the show notes, but is the YouTube channel Sail Cargo? Yeah, I think so. Sail Cargo Inc. I think it Sail is. Cargo Inc. On YouTube. Yeah. All right, great. Because definitely the, some of the videos you guys have produced for this place are exciting. Yeah, thanks, yeah. man. Yeah, cool. I thank you for thank you for this interview, Jason, and for and for everything that you do too. I I I, I appreciate the things that you're doing for everybody. All right, we'll make some impact together, huh? Yeah, right, <laughs> right on. <laughs>